told you that all the magical breath attacks that you see in How to Train Your Dragon are real. Ice breath, fire breath, lightning, acid sound, all of them are just waiting for you to unlock. In fact, most of them aren't even that hard to achieve. Just get ready for a little dose of science on the way. What can I say? We're theorists. It's an occupational hazard. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the show that's been drag on you to learn things since 2015. You know, when it comes to fantasy creatures, nothing is quite as iconic as the dragon. And right now, they seem to be undergoing a bit of a renaissance in pop culture. House of the Dragon basically saved the Game of Thrones IP. There are whispers of a new Spyro game in the works. There's the new Dungeons and Dragons movie with a TV show not far behind. And the D&D livestream Critical Role has had two seasons of their show adapted into the genuinely fantastic Legend of Vox Machina. Even you Universal is starting to get in on the trend, announcing that they're gonna go the Disney route by giving How to Train Your Dragon a live-action remake. And that's in addition to the 19 seasons of television that they've already made out of this thing. And so with all this dragon talk going on, I decided to re-binge the entire How to Train Your Dragon series. And of course, my theorist brain started to do the thing that all theorist brains do. It started overanalyzing everything about the film. Specifically, I was fascinated by all the different breath attacks that the dragons in the world seem to have. Sure, you've got yourself your classic fire breath, but over the course of the series, we also learn about dragons who use boiling water, electricity, ice, acid, even sound. The creatures that use all these attacks are also really diverse in terms of their size and appearance, which got me wondering, is any of this actually possible? What would animals who use these sorts of attacks actually look like? How to Train Your Dragon puts a surprising amount of care into their dragon designs, but do they actually hold up to real-world scrutiny? Well, saddle up, loyal theorists! Today we're looking at the biology of these dragons to see which of the breath attacks are the most biologically sound. Let me tell ya! If dragons like the ones that we see here existed in the real world, the most effective power isn't the one that you'd expect. So I think we should just go ahead and get the granddaddy of all dragon breath attacks out of the way first here. The iconic fire breath. Now obviously no lizard or reptile in nature actually straight up breathes fire like a dragon. That's an entirely fictional thing for myth. But believe it or not, this sort of thing is very feasible in nature. And we can say this thanks to an itty bitty little insect called the bombardier beetle. Now, I've already talked about this in detail in an episode about the terrifying truth of fire Pokemon over on our sister location Game Theory. So just to quickly sum this one up, when threatened, the bombardier beetle shoots out scalding chemicals at its foes. It does this by using three organs in its abdomen. Two of those organs are glands that produce hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide. The third organ is where those two chemicals mix together. When combined, they perform a reduction-oxidation reaction, which basically means that they get themselves really, really hot. The bombardier beetle then shoots that liquid at whatever threat they perceive. Now, what the bombardier beetle shoots is a heated liquid, which lines up well with the scaldrons that we hear about in How to Train Your Dragon. Scald Sprays scalding water at its victim. Extremely dangerous. But what about more actual fire? Well, this same concept could work with a variety of different chemical combinations. For instance, potassium chlorate and ordinary table sugar, when combined with a drop of sulfuric acid, releases large quantities of heat energy in the form of awesome purple flames. Like, legitimately, a purple flame-spewing dragon would be awesome. On the less awesome, but still very biologically feasible side, are farts. You see, in a short we released earlier this week, we took a closer look at the new Dungeons and Dragons movie to see just how its dragon uses fire breath. Based on the footage that we see in the film, you can see that it breathes out a clear gas that it then ignites using a spark in the back of its throat or just general heat in the world around it. That gas that it's spewing, that's likely methane, a gas that occurs naturally in almost all animals in the form of farts. It's clear, it's flammable, and, well, it would bring new meaning to the phrase dragon breath. I guess the old saying is true. Why fart and waste it? We can burp and light it on fire to scorch your foes to death. So, now that we've figured out a few mechanisms for fire breath, time to get creative. What about some of the more unusual types of breath attacks that we see in these movies? Like, say, electric breath. It's something that we see in fantasy media all the time. The legend of Vox Machina begins with a giant blue dragon. And nothing is more iconic than Yu-Gi-Oh's blue eyes white dragon and its white lightning attack. Go white lightning attack! <laughs> Except both of these examples result in one major problem, electricity is unpredictable. Electric charges are created when electrons jump between objects. Since electrons are negatively charged particles, having fewer electrons creates a positive electric charge, and having a bunch of extra electrons creates a negative charge. And when the difference between the positive and the negative get big enough, the electrons jump to balance themselves out, to become neutral again. The problem is, it'll do this with literally anything it can find. The electricity doesn't care, it'll just go to the closest thing that it can trade electrons with, but for an electric 
breath attack to work, the dragons wouldn't just need to change its electron count, it would also need a way to make sure that its target was the best option to transfer electrons with. And the only way to do that would be by manipulating the amount of electrons the target has. That said, directing lightning can be done. Back in January of 2012, reports started to circulate about the US Army testing a lightning weapon. One that was able to attack using 50 billion watts of energy. how they manage to control the lightning? Using a laser. It was called the Laser Induced Plasma Channel, or LIPC for short. Basically, how it worked was that a laser would put out a pulse of energy. This pulse had to be incredibly brief, only about two trillionths of a second, but that was enough to create a path for the lightning to follow. Before that, in 1993, the US Air Force and Naval Weapons Research Divisions both successfully conducted tests into plasma railguns, devices intended to capture plasma and then launch it in specific directions. Basically, they were trying to weaponize balls of lightning that were hotter than the surface of the sun and could detonate with an explosive force of five pounds of TNT on contact, all while discharging an electromagnetic burst that could scramble most electronic devices in the area. And while that was certainly impressive, what was even more impressive was this thing's name, Project Marauder, with Marauder actually being a real acronym that stood for real words that made sense. Get this, magnetically accelerated ring to achieve ultra high directed energy and radiation. Slow clap. I hope that someone got a raise for coming up with that one. And while both projects did wind up being successful, the only problem were the power demands. They were too high for weapons that had such limited range, which made them impractical, and the projects went away. In short, the best way of making a lightning weapon work for both the military, and by extension our dragon friends, is to get re- really darn close to the intended target, which then encourages the lightning to jump over to them. And there are creatures that do this exact thing. The most famous of these is obviously the electric eel, which is able to release powerful electric shocks upwards of 650 volts, five times more powerful than a standard US wall socket. It then uses those shocks to stun their prey so they can eat them. Believe it or not, this actually lines up really well with what we see in How to Train Your Dragon. Rather than launching targeted lightning beams from his mouth, Toothless is instead able to create smaller electric sparks around its body. In the hidden world, Toothless seems to create electric potentials all across his own body, resulting in electricity crackling across his skin before lightning from a storm cloud ultimately hits him. In short, How to Train Your Dragon gives us the most realistic portrayal of what a dragon's lightning powers would have to look like in real life. Moving on to the coolest of the attacks that we see in these movies, Ice Breath. See what I did there? I said cool and you thought that I meant cool as in awesome, but I meant literally cool, like from a temperature basis, thermodynamically cool. Just wanted y'all to appreciate the layer nuance that goes into these streamy award-winning scripts. Anyway, in How to Train Your Dragon 2, we meet the Bewilder Beasts, giant dragons that breathe out super-cooled liquid that's able to freeze on contact. Now, you know what you're saying? A reptile that breathes ice. Sounds impossible. And you're not wrong. As cold-blooded animals, reptiles and ice just don't mix all that well. You ever seen a lizard just out in the wild, hanging out in a rock, baking in the sun? It's doing that to get heat from the rock in the sun to regulate its body temperature. Somewhere between 12 and a half to 35 degrees Celsius, or 54 and a half to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, depending depending on what animal you're talking about. Much higher than the temperature of ice. But if we stop and take a look at how the bewilder beasts act in the movie, we can actually find a scientifically feasible explanation for this breath weapon. In fact, it would actually function very similarly to fire breath except in reverse. You see, explosions and fire? Well, those are exothermic reactions. They're chemical reactions that release a ton of heat. To create ice breath that freezes on contact, our dragons would need to create the exact opposite reaction than that. An endothermic reaction, where the reactants absorb heat energy from their surroundings, thereby making things colder. And we actually have the perfect example of this in our day-to-day -day lives using instant ice packs. If you've ever gotten into an injury, these things are clutch. And the beauty of them is that they're just super simple. The liquid inside the cold pack is just water. Easy. But inside the water is another tube that contains ammonium nitrate, a common ingredient of fertilizer. When you bend the ice pack and cause the inner tube to break, that ammonium nitrate salt dissolves into the water around it to create an endothermic chemical reaction that absorbs heat. This reaction action then causes the water to cool down and the pack becomes ice. Now just look at the bewilder beast as he breathes. He's breathing out a liquid that freezes into ice on contact. Just like with the fire breath, the dragon could store water in one side of its body and the ammonium nitrate in another. That would then allow the dragon to keep a stable internal body temperature despite being a cold-blooded creature. The chemical reaction that creates the ice isn't happening until after it breathes out those two reactants. It's a cool attack that would be powered by even cooler science. And heck, if the animal needed more protection, 
section, maybe it's insulated with layers of blubber, like some ancient reptilian dinosaurs had. That would explain why the Bewilder Beasts are just so naturally big. But now let's switch gears into something completely different. Something that really starts to get us out of the realm of fantasy. In the original How to Train Your Dragon, the Thunder Drum Dragon uses a sound-based breath weapon. When startled, the Thunder Drum produces a concussive sound that can kill a man at close range. Surprise! We already have animals in the real world that use sound like a gun. Case in point, the Pistol Shrimp. This little guy is no joke, and its power comes from this massive claw. When it wants to intimidate an opponent, attack prey, or even burrow into a rock, it's able to snap the claw shut quickly enough to shoot an air bubble at whatever it's aiming at. At long ranges, that makes a loud, scary sound, but at short range, it can stun or flat out kill any other small shrimp or fish. Again, exactly like what we hear about with the Thunder Drum. Produces a concussive sound that can kill a man at close range. And when you look at the science here, it's easy to see how they're so lethal. The snap of the claw produces a sound that can reach 218 decibels in volume underwater. Just how loud's that? Well, a whisper? It's roughly 30 decibels. A normal conversation is about 60 decibels, and a rock concert hits at around 120 decibels. But decibels rise exponentially. That means that a 10 decibel increase makes the sound 10 times louder. The 218 decibel pistol shrimp is roughly 10 billion times louder than the 120 decibel concert. Yep, hear that right, billion, with a B. Now, the numbers there aren't gonna exactly line up one-to-one -one with what you'd probably expect because sound works differently underwater, it's muffled by the different pressures, but the sound is powerful enough that American submarines used to use reefs full of pistol shrimp to hide from Japanese sonar. And as you can see here in this video, the pops made by the pistol shrimp are incredibly loud compared to their size, audible even through aquarium glass. If a dragon were able to reproduce this sort of attack above the water, maybe by snapping its jaw shut quickly, it would be devastating. And as an added bonus, we see in How to Train Your Dragon that the dragons rely on sound as one of their primary senses while hunting. Nice. Make lots of it to throw off a dragon's aim. So not only would the sound potentially be deadly, but it's also going to be devastating for any opponent's navigational abilities. Which brings us now to one of the easiest attacks to explain using science, Acid Breath. In How to Train Your Dragon 3, the villainous Grimmel has several tamed death gripper dragons that spew acid that's able to corrode through almost anything it touches. Now, while the strength of the death gripper acid is definitely cranked up to 11 for the movies, this sort of offensive ability is pretty darn common across the animal kingdom. Several insects, like termites, ants, and scorpions are able to spray or sting with acid, while many species of cobra are just able to accurately spew their acidic venom several feet away. Even some birds, like the Fulmar Petrel and Turkey Vulture, can vomit up stomach acid and use it as a projectile weapon. That is pretty darn gross. It is also pretty darn similar to what we see the Death Grippers do in the movies, so don't really need to explain it much further than that. So as it turns out, these sorts of breath weapons are shockingly plausible in real life. There are real-world animals out there right now using these very attacks, like the Pistol Shrimp and the Spitting Cobra. And if they're not using the exact attack, then they're using mechanisms that are pretty darn close to what we see happening happening in fantasy media, like with the bombardier beetle and the electric eel. But you know what they say, truth can be stranger than fiction. And in the case of dragons, all of us are sleeping on the terror that is the real life dragon, the Komodo dragon. While we're busy creating fantasy worlds like Burke, these guys are just hanging out in Indonesia. And while we're concocting explanations for fire breath and freeze breath and lightning rays, these lumbering monitor lizards are just decimating the competition not with breath attacks, but with bite attacks. The Komodo dragon has a very powerful venom that's generated in several ducts between their teeth, injecting that venom into anything it wants to eat, or just eat later. The venom contains over 50 different toxic proteins, a deadly mix that rapidly decreases the blood pressure of its victim, expediting blood loss and sending their bodies into shock, rendering the prey too weak to fight back. The Komodo dragon then just rolls over and eats them at their leisure. And the craziest part of it all? It is so effective that the bite doesn't even need to be that strong. Studies have shown that the Komodo dragon's bite is weaker than that of the common house cat. As long as it pierces the skin, that's all it needs. In the end, for as fantastical as dragon may seem in pop culture, the science is right there in the nature around us. Sure, the pistol shrimp might not be sitting atop his hoard of gold, and he might not be able to ride a Komodo dragon as majestically through the air as Hiccup on top of Toothless, but the animal world is crazy, and we're understanding more about the wonders of how it works every single day. In this world full of technology and screens and CGI, we often overlook that our world is already a really cool place filled with incredible creatures. Sometimes it takes a fictional series to help us appreciate the real-life wonders around us. But hey! That doesn't mean that we should be depriving ourselves of the fantasy. And you can get more dragon goodness right now thanks to the sponsor of today's episode, Call of Dragons. This new MMO fantasy conquest game for iOS, Android, and PC is from the creators of Rise of Kingdoms. And it plays like a 4X strategy game mashed together with the best elements of MMORPGs, allowing you to explore a new fantasy world all while recruiting elven maidens, mighty orcs, and powerful mages to your cause. But the real selling point here? Dragons. I mean, come on.
Pokemon. It's in the name, Call of Dragons. The game features a ton of giant behemoth monsters that you can tame and unleash onto the battlefield, including giant bears, thunder rocks, and of course, the fire-breathing dragon. Let me tell you, there is nothing more satisfying than getting a dragon out onto the field and changing the tide of battle. Well, maybe one day when I'm able to get my hands on that lightning railgun, yeah, that, that, that'd be pretty darn cool. But until then, there's Call of Dragons. Between running these channels and spending time with the family, let me tell you, I don't have a ton of time to play games anymore, especially the really in-depth RPGs that I grew up loving. But having a game like Call of Dragons on my phone where I can play in between meetings and recordings, it's awesome. I highly recommend that you check it out by going to their official website by scanning the QR code that you see on screen right now or clicking the link in the description below and using the promo code TFTPLAYCOD for a special bonus. That's T-F-T-P-L-A-Y-C-O-D. Thank you again to Call of Dragons for sponsoring today's episode and I'll see you all next week with a brand new installment. Until then, as always, my friends, remember it's all just a theory. A film theory. And cut.